Anna Montravati is going to talk uh, to us about a study that's been ongoing at Wills looking at a comparison of different ways of looking at the angle. Thanks, Jay. Um, just by show of hands, I guess, uh, how many people use anterior segment imaging of some modality in their practice on a regular basis? And is it for diagnostic purposes or for screening purposes? So, for example, screening for narrow angles or? Research. Pardon me? Only for research. Research purposes. Okay. Diagnostic. And, and, and what format? Just for diagnostic dilemmas or for actual narrow angle identification? For the narrow angle identification, you use cornioscopy. Certain cases, you use UVM to detect certain, for example, eyes control. That's right. Yeah. Question? Oh, comment. His his answer. The, the, the question was, uh, in what format do people use anterior uh, OCT in its current iteration? Is it for diagnostic screening of narrow angles, or is it for sort of sorting out diagnostic dilemmas? or A diagnostic, Mostly diagnostic dilemmas, and we don't use uh, OCT, but uh, UVM. UVM, okay. Great. So uh, what I'd like to talk about is a study that we've been doing here at Wills um, regarding anterior segment imaging and comparison to gonioscopy. And the perspective with which we wanted to approach this was comparing real-time, real-life uh, clinical, the way people perform gonioscopy, and the idea of using anterior segment OCT as a screening for population. So, um, you know, the use of imaging's place in screening large populations. So that's the approach with which we wanted to take here. First of all, I have no financial uh, interest in the material being presented. We did receive a grant. It's a light. Oh, okay, here we go. Thank you. Okay. We did receive a uh, grant from the American Glaucoma Society for this uh, project and also a Will's Eye Innovation Grant. So let's first um, start by reiterating the problem. Uh, we don't need to spend much time on this, but that primary angle closure glaucoma is a significant uh, morbidity worldwide. And due to the expanding scope of the uh, populations, especially in high-risk areas such as China and India, uh, it's thought that primary angle closure glaucoma might even exceed open angle glaucoma on a global scale. And it's estimated that 90% of this population is due to relative pupillary block for which a laser erdotomy can be a definitive treatment. So when we talk about using gonioscopy in a population of people that are at high risk who might not have access to care, some of the issues are that, you know, it involves a single observer who's experienced, that there is some variability even in experienced practitioners in terms of interpretations of semi-quantitative findings, that it can miss appositional closure with poor technique if there's excessive compression or excessive ambient lighting, and it does require trained skills. As we were alluding to in the CDC project earlier, you know, we specialists were doing it. So what happens when, you know, uh, a person who might not have as much experience with gonioscopy uh, uh, is uh, required to perform these things? So can technology help? That's the question. Can we use technology to help facilitate screening large populations to identify who's most at risk of having uh, problems from angle closure? And there are several methods for which one can image the angle. There's uh, the Scheinflug method as above the high-frequency ultrasound of the UBM, and the OCT. And what we chose to focus on was the OCT, which uses a light source. So the advantages of OCT is that it's high scanning resolution. It's a non-contact imaging modality. Uh, one can treat, uh, uh, teach untrained personnel. So the idea that this skill can be transferred to which large populations can be evaluated is very appealing. And it can be performed in total darkness. So it's obje objective with high-resolution visualization and reproducible, and this has been demonstrated in a number of studies that some of the anterior segment parameters are reproducible. The two imaging modalities we looked at were the Cirrus and the Visante. The Visante has a higher wavelength, and it's thought that with the higher wavelength, there's deeper penetration into ciliary body structures. If we look at anterior segment OCT's agreement with gonioscopy, it's very good. It's very sensitive. Uh, under dark light conditions, 94% uh, uh, of folks uh, were diagnosed with angle closure by ASOCT, and that number diminishes when you raise the ambient lighting, which makes sense. Angle closure is also thought to be detected.
infected with higher incidence with ASOCT compared to gonioscopy, 71% versus 50% in one study. And some of the thoughts as to why that is is maybe the different lighting, different landmarks that are used to define angle closure with ASOCT in comparison to gonioscopy, and maybe some just technical aspects of distorting the eye when, when improperly performing gonioscopy. So our study was to compare the performance of gonioscopy uh, with Visante and Cirrus in detecting angle closure to identify the interchangeability of these imaging modalities, to look at the semi-quantitative nature of gonioscopy, comparing it to the objective parameters of ASOCT, and specifically identify how these different methods of evaluating the angle compare when evaluating patient risk for angle closure and identifying uh, narrow angles. So this was a cross-sectional observational study. We looked at one eye, 50 consecutive patients. Patients did not have any prior surgery. were not on any myotic uh, 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 in the past, recruited through our institute. And they each underwent uh, examination by three independent examiners. They underwent uh, space classification gonioscopy, and were graded uh, using that classification system. And then also were, used, were asked to estimate a grade of closed, high risk, medium risk, or low to no risk of going on to angle closure. This was done with standardized ambient lighting, but we didn't standardize the beam width, again, to try to approximate real life conditions in terms of how different examiners might examine different people on a day-to-day -day situation. And this same eye was imaged with both Visante and Cirrus ASOCT in scotopic and photopic conditions. So the imaging was rated by a single examiner, uh, and uh, they were masked to the gonioscopy findings. And they were also asked to make an estimation as to uh, whether the angle was closed, was there a high possibility of risk, medium risk, or low to no risk of going on to angle closure. Here are some of the demographics of our study. Uh, average age is about 60. You can see the diagnosis was fairly widespread amongst both open angle and angle closure glaucomas, or suspects, narrow angles. And if we look at the inter-rater agreement amongst the gonioscopists, one can see that there was almost perfect agreement with regards to the classification uh, on gonioscopy in terms of the insertion, the angle, and also the determination of risk. If we look at the agreement on determining if the angle was open or closed, both Cirrus and Visante agreed with each other substantially. But if you compare Cirrus to gonioscopy and Visante to gonioscopy independently, that agreement dropped to more moderate ranges. And if we look at the imaging results, particularly in Visante and Cirrus, here in gonioscopy, one determines whether the angle is either open or closed. So it's a, you know, basically an even split. But if you look at Visante and Cirrus, there's a high percentage that could not be determined. So 42% in Visante and 38% in Cirrus. If we look at uh, the percentage of open angles on ASOCT, it increases in light. But again, the main thing was that there was almost 40 greater than 40% of images that could not be determined. So a high number of indetermined images with ASOCT. Why is that? Well, let's take a look at some of the images. So in the Cirrus, here you can see an example of the structures delineated as such, Schw uh, Schwabe's line, the scleral spur, the cirri body band, very nicely identified. But then here is a, an example of another image whereby these structures were less identifiable. Look at some of the Visante images. Visante comes with a caliper whereby some of the parameters such as AOD 500 and other parameters that are uh, talked about in research uh, articles are, are, can be reported. And you can see here the caliper being used, but there are a number of Visante images as well, up to 40% that uh, the structures were not clearly delineated. So gonioscopy demonstrated substantial agreement in angle grade. Uh, it de demonstrated substantial agreement in the classification of angle closure risk amongst the examiners. And the imaging modalities agree with each other very well. But if you compared Cirrus and Visante to gonioscopy, it only showed fair agreement. Now, that data, that fair agreement data, does include the images that were not identifiable in terms of the landmarks. So if you exclude those images, I would estimate that the agreement would go up quite a bit. But again, keeping this in perspective as a modality that can be used to screen large populations, it's important to understand what percentage of images can't be used due to image quality artifact in its current iteration. Now, certainly these images um, ha hold a lot of promise. Uh, you know, clearly you've all seen very beautiful illustrations of the anterior segment with clearly identifiable uh, landmarks. But in its current iteration, 
uh, this is consistent with other studies whereby many images, in some studies up to 72% of images, could not be used because of inability to identify landmarks. So um, there is some variable agreement in the current iteration of the imaging to gonioscopy. Uh, but again, with any technology, we hope that enhanced resolution leads to enhanced sensitivities. Certainly, these imaging modalities have been very helpful in identifying who's at risk for closure, some of the work out of Hopkins with regards to dynamic parameters that can be identified. Volumetric expansion of the ciliary body uh, is, has been very helpful in terms of identifying the pathology of why angle closure develops. And then again, the promise of teleophthalmology. As these images hopefully get better and better, if the number of unusable images decreases, then this does have really have a role. Instead of training one single gonioscopist to screen thousands and thousands of people, you know, you can train an untrained personnel to do these things and, uh, and can identify those at risk to kind of treat this global issue of blindness. So um, with that, I'll close. If anyone has any other uh, comments, questions, uh, I'd be happy to take them.